thank you for joining us tonight for the VMC Animal Health Education Series. My name is Lauren Kraft, and I partner with clients and clinicians at the Veterinary Medical Center to serve animals and their families. The series features our leading experts covering a variety of topics in veterinary medicine, ranging from relevant health information for your beloved pets to ways that we're advancing clinical research that will serve dogs, cats, and people for generations to come. During the presentation, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom to ask questions. We also ask for pre-submitted questions and we'll do our best to cover the themes that come up most frequently during the final portion of the program. Please note that if your question relates to your pet's specific medical care, it is best to call the VMC directly or have your primary care veterinarian contact our team for a consultation so that we can best serve your family. I'd like to introduce our speakers for tonight, Drs. Alistair McVeigh and Susan Arnold. Dr. McVeigh is an associate professor in the Veterinary Clinical Sciences Department of the College of Veterinary Medicine and head of the VMC's Neurology Service. He is a graduate of the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine and a diplomate with the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. Dr. Arnold is an assistant professor in the Veterinary Clinical Sciences Department of the College of Veterinary Medicine. She graduated from the University of Wisconsin and did her residency at the University of Georgia before joining the VMC. She is a diplomate with the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine and is currently working toward her PhD. We're grateful to have Drs. McVeigh and Arnold with us tonight to discuss spinal issues in dogs and cats. With that, I'll hand it over to our neurology team. Before we get going, if you can hear me, um, I, my video won't let me come on. Does the, there we go. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren, for that introduction. Uh, we're really excited to be speaking with all of you tonight. I'm Dr. Arnold and- I'm Dr. McVeigh. Yeah. And uh, together we're going to take you through what we think are the important things to think about for dogs and cats that have um, issues with their backs and their necks. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with all of you. Okay, Dr. McVeigh, can you see my PowerPoint? I can. Wonderful, okay. All right, so um, as, as we stated earlier, tonight what we're going to cover are neck and back issues in dogs. And I put um, in cats in here as well, because although most of the things that we're going to be talking about are specific to dogs tonight, they're not actually specific to dogs. And so we have a series of cases for you tonight to cover and all of those patients are dogs, but cats get almost all the same issues in their necks and their backs that dogs do. There are some diseases that affect cats more than dogs and vice versa, um, but for the most part, what we're talking about in dogs also applies to cats. And if there are specific questions about cats later on, we're happy to take any of those questions as well. So what we'll do tonight is we'll go through and just do a, a quick anatomy lesson for all of you so that you feel comfortable with some of the terminology we'll be using and also to make it easier for you to understand why animals develop the dysfunctions that they do depending on where their problem is. Then we'll show you some videos of affected patients so you have a good idea of representative images of what these patients look like when they're neurologically abnormal. We'll talk about some non-neurological causes of pain and or gait abnormalities that might be something that would be confused for a neurological issue but ultimately are due to a problem elsewhere. And then we'll get into really the, the meat of our, our discussion tonight, which is going to be a case-based presentation for all of you. So just some important anatomy to consider. We're neurologists, and so that means that we focus on diseases affecting brains and backs, right? brains and spinal cords to be specific. And tonight we're talking about diseases that may or may not be affecting the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is located within the vertebral column. That is the medical term for the backbone. And the vertebral column is made up of several, many actually numerous backbones, which are called vertebrae. And running through the hollow center of each vertebra is the vertebral canal, which is where the spinal cord lives. The spinal cord is surrounded by meninges. So what you can see here in this diagram is that the tan image is the vertebra. And then within the vertebral canal, we have the spinal cord. And the meninges are the protective layer that surround the spinal cord and kind of keep it safe. The meninges have pain receptors in them. The spinal cord does not have pain receptors in it. And then sitting underneath, in the dog at least, 
um, underneath the spinal cord are these intervertebral discs. And I say underneath because when we are thinking about dogs and cats, we think about them being on all fours. But if we're thinking about a disc in a person, that would be kind of more towards our center away from our backbone. And these intervertebral discs, what they do is they act as shock absorbers. And so they kind of bear some cushioning effect when animals are moving around and when their back is moving around. The spinal cord's function is that it essentially serves as a two-way expressway system between the limbs and the brain. And so it connects the brain to the limbs and vice versa. And so by providing information from the limbs, the spinal cord will allow the brain to understand what exactly is going on with those limbs. And then the brain is able to then generate movements. And so that's the whole point of the spinal cord is to connect the brain with the limbs and vice versa. When we do a neurological exam, what we're doing there is we're trying to figure out what, where the problem is in the animal's nervous system. Can't necessarily tell you what the problem is, but the goal of a neurological examination is to localize to a specific region within the nervous system. And specifically as it pertains to the canine spinal cord, the spinal cord is divided into segments. And these segments are the exact same segments that we see in people for the most part. Um, and so dog and cat spinal cords are very similar to human spinal cords. And the segments that we have are named based off of the vertebra in which they are housed and then the number vertebra. And so what you can see here is that we have several various segments to talk about. We have the C1 to the C5 region, the C6 to T2 region, the T3 to L3 region, the L4 to S1 region, and the S1 to S3 region. The C in C1 to C5 refers to cervical, meaning neck. And so the C1 to C5 region of the spinal cord is found within the first, is houses the first five cervical segments of the spinal cord, right? The T stands for thoracic, the L stands for lumbar, and the S stands for sacral. And this is all just referring to the bones in which this part of the spinal cord is housed. And so when we're talking about where a patient's lesion localizes to, if they have a problem in their spinal cord, we're going to localize to one of these very specific segments based off of what their neurological examination looks like. And it depends on how many limbs are affected. So if they have a problem in all four limbs, then they have a problem either in the C1 to C5 region of their spinal cord or the C6 to T2 region of their spinal cord. Those are the two segments of the spinal cord that carry information to and from both the front and back legs. Now, if they only have a problem in their back legs, then they have a problem either in the T3 to L3 region or the L4 to S1 region. And so if they're neurologically normal in their front legs, the problem has to be behind their front legs and will be either in the T3 to L3 or the L4 to S1 region. And what their neurological dysfunction looks like depends on which segment is affected. And so we can distinguish between C1 to C5 and C6 to T2 based off of the fact that their neurological examinations are going to be different from each other. Depending on where the lesion is, their gait might look short and choppy and they might have some weakness to go with it, or they might have a long and lopy gait. They're uncoordinated and they have exaggerated movements. And it just depends specifically on where the lesion is within these different segments. In terms of what we're looking for, right, when we're evaluating a patient who comes to us, we wanna know, do they have evidence of pain and do they have evidence of neurological dysfunction? So neck or back pain occurs in patients because there's a problem either leading to pain in a bone. So for example, maybe there's an issue with a vertebra or there's meningeal pain. You'll recall that I mentioned earlier that the meninges, right, that protective coat around the spinal cord, those are innervated with pain receptors. And so if there's something that's pushing on the meninges, that can lead to neck or back pain. Now myelopathy is a term that means spinal cord dysfunction. So this MRI here is showing you a cross section through a dog's vertebra with the spinal cord there. And so what you're seeing here is this is the spinal cord housed within the vertebral canal. So this is a very normal looking slice through a dog's spinal cord. Now, if there was something that was causing compression of this spinal cord or some other sort of abnormality, that patient would have a myelopathy, meaning a spinal cord dysfunction. And depending on what type of lesion it is, that may or may not be accompanied with neck or back pain, depending on if that lesion is also leading to pain in a bone or in the meninges. Some neurological diseases only cause pain. Other neurological diseases only cause a myelopathy. They only cause neurological dysfunction. 
Many diseases that we see on a regular basis cause both pain as well as a myelopathy. So Dr. McVeigh is gonna walk you through what patients look like if they have neck or back pain. So Dr. McVeigh, do you want to explain what you might see in a patient who has back pain? Sure, it, it, um, back pain dogs, um, they look painful. Um, just like the little docs in here, they'll potentially get that roached back. They don't want to, to move a lot, or um, if they do move, they're very cautious in their movement. You go to pick them up, and depending on how you pick up your dog, whether you just sort of pick them up in the middle or you support them both front and back can help you somewhat localize the pain. So if you're picking them up, they yelp. Um, you know, they're not wanting to jump. They're not wanting to go up and down steps. Um, that's, the, that's a typical back dog. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, and this dog is for us, what would a neck dog look like? They look very similar. Um, sometimes you can't tell just by looking at them. In this case, you'll, you'll see with cervical dogs, they have a really stiff neck. They just sit there and they get tight and they, they move everything in one go, where if they're a back dog, they're gonna be moving their head and neck around pretty freely. Um, if they're, depending on what's happening in the cervical spine, um, you might get a lameness in a front leg because of a pinched nerve, what we call a root signature. Um, like this dog is um, displaying. Um, again, they're reluctant to move. They're not gonna wanna look up at you um, with their head and nose looking up. A lot of times they'll look up with their eyes um, is another um, giveaway that this dog has cervical pain. Next. Excellent, thank you. So now we are going to talk about what myelopathies look like. And so what this means once again is that we have a patient who is neurologically abnormal referable to a region of the spinal cord being affected. So T3 to L3 and L4 to S1 myelopathies will affect only the back legs and C1 to C5 and C6 to T2 myelopathies will affect all four of the legs. So Dr. McVeigh is going to walk you through what these patients look like when they have lesions at specific locations. So first of all, what does an L4 to S1 myelopathy look like? So with these dogs, because it's at the caudal end or the back end of the spinal cord, the front legs are gonna look normal. So you're gonna see them gait all right up there. In the back end, um, they're gonna be weak because um, the nerves that are affected are the ones that are going down to the legs. So these dogs can get sort of this long sort of lopy um, type of gait. You might see them drop in their hawk um, because that sciatic isn't working to keep their limbs up appropriately. So if we watch this um, Labrador walk by, um, you'll sort of see them dropping down in the back end as they proceed while the front end looks pretty darn normal because it is. What about patients with a T3L3 myelopathy? What do those patients look like? So yeah, so with uh, the T3L3, again, the front end is gonna be very normal um, on these dogs. They're gonna gait normal. Their head and neck as movement's gonna be all right. They're, they're, they're gonna have more of an exaggerated gait um, where the, the dogs that have a caudal myelopathy, the L6 caudal, those dogs will drop. Um, these, um, it's more of an exaggerated gait. You might see them crossing over quite a bit more. Um, so it can look similar in its appearance um, to uh, the lower limb, um, but not quite as weak. Excellent.
paper available for review in our recorded session of this. What about patients with a C6 to T2 myelopathy? What are those patients? Yeah, so here we're gonna be affecting all four limbs, um, but because it's affecting that cervical intumescence, that C6 to um, T2 kind of area, so the nerves going down to the front legs, um, they potentially can have weakness in all four legs. Um, the fronts are gonna be a very short choppy gait. They almost look like they're doing a two-step um, compared to what the back end does. Again, the back end um, is going to look similar to that T3L3 myelopathy with that exaggerated kind of long stride, the crossing over the what we call um, ataxia um, that way. Excellent, thank you. And then how about a patient with a C1 to C5 myelopathy? So there, um, again, it can look very similar, um, but the, instead of having these short choppy gates in front, um, they're gonna be a little bit more exaggerated in how they move their legs. You're gonna see them crossing over um, as well in all four limbs, um, potentially even knuckling over where they kind of crumple over on the front end, um, not just in the back. Okay, thank you very much for that. What are some other causes of pain or gait abnormalities that we sometimes see in our patients? 
Yeah, so that's a that's something we have to deal with almost weekly um, that we see a case in. And that's where the neurologic exam comes in to say, are we seeing neurological deficits? Is that what's affecting this animal's ability to, to get around? Um, but there's a lot of things that are not neurologic that can look similar. And on the list, probably the one that we see um, most commonly this way are gonna be the orthopedic issues. So the dogs with bilateral cruciates, um, they have a ruptured tear in their knee, um, a ligament tear, it's painful. Those dogs don't want to walk because it hurts. Um, but if we support them and do our exam, you'll see them um, flip their feet normally, their reflexes are normal, they don't have any back pain. Um, when you're doing your complete exam, so we'll go on and do our orthopedic exam and, and find that they're, they're ouchy someplace else. Um, we see a lot of animals um, that the, the owners are concerned about Lyme disease or some type of tick transmitted disease causing joint pain with difficulty walking. Um, it does happen, we do see it, but they usually have other signs that go along with Lyme disease as well. Um, it can affect the, the, the central nervous system. Those dogs look sick. They typically aren't strictly back dogs. Um, they'll, if it's affecting the central nervous system, they'll have some brain signs as well. Um, you can have soft tissue injury. So you get your athletic dog, has a groin pull or an iliosolus tear. Those can be difficult to differentiate from a back issue without good localization of the pain. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, with that, we are ready to go through some cases. So we invite you all to join us at our neurology clinic. We have four patients to see today. And to get you on our level, we just need to go over a couple of important terms before we get started. So some important terminology for you uh, are listed here. So first of all, signalment. A signalment is a patient's age, breed, and sex. So for example, for this dog, this could be a five-year-old neuter male corgi. The presenting complaint is the issue that's brought the pet into the clinic. So for example, dragging limbs or vomiting, those would be presenting complaints. The history is your observation of what you're seeing with your pet at home, other medical issues that might be going on with your pet, as well as whatever medications they're receiving. And the differential diagnosis list is a list of the possible causes of what we're seeing in your pet. How we approach your pets are essentially in this kind of the systematic process. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to gather information. And this is a really important step. So getting a history from you, meaning discussing what you've been observing at home is a really important part of figuring out what's going on with your pet. And so we like to know how long has, have you been observing these clinical signs? Do you feel like things are getting worse? Have you given any medications? And what has that led to? Things like that, right? The next thing that we're going to do is a full physical examination, meaning we make sure that their heart is beating appropriately, their lungs are ascolting or sound normal, we palpate their bellies to make sure we don't find anything surprising in their abdomens, etc. And then after that, we'll do both full orthopedic and neurological examinations, especially when we're not fully sure if a patient's issue is neurological or, or orthopedic in origin. And the reason that we're doing that neurological examination is to figure out where among those segments your pet's issue is. Once we have gathered this information, we'll then move on to the next step, which is processing that information. And this is where we compile a differential diagnosis list. This allows us to create an exhaustive list of the possible diseases that might be affecting your pet. From there, we will plan diagnostic tests that we will use to help us narrow down our differentials and to confirm the cause of disease. Because you'll remember that a neurological exam will tell us where the problem is, but it doesn't tell us what the problem is. We need additional diagnostic tests to figure out which of the differentials is causing your pet's issue. After that, we'll plan treatment where we will prepare an idea of a plan for medications, surgeries in some cases. We'll create a monitoring or follow-up plan and discuss long-term uh, plans with you as well. The differential diagnosis list is a way to make sure that we don't neglect any possible cause of what's going on with your pet. And so this means that we will put things on the list that maybe are quite uncommon, but we don't wanna forget about them because they might occur every once in a while. And there are a lot of different acronyms that people use. My personal favorite is vitamin D, which is listed here. And this acronym provides us with the ability to think about all the broad categories that can lead to neurological disease in our pets. So for example, vascular, this means, was there something like a stroke that happened? Idiopathic means, is there some sort of an unknown benign or unknown condition that is leading to your pet's issues, right? Neoplasia is a medical term for cancer. 
So once we've created an exhaustive list using our vitamin D scheme, we need to rank those differentials. We need to decide what's most likely and what is least likely. And so we use a combination of historical, physical exam, neuro exam observations to put our differentials in order. So age is important. Some diseases will only affect young dogs. Some diseases only affect old dogs. Breed is also important. We see some diseases much more commonly in certain breeds than we do in others. The progression of the disease is also important. Some disease get, get, diseases get worse over time, others don't. Examination findings are really important as some diseases will only cause pain, others will only cause myelopathy and others cause both. And then the frequency. There are some diseases that are so-called zebras, meaning that they happen very infrequently and there are other diseases that we see every single day. So congratulations, you are ready to see some patients. We'll go ahead with our clinic. So our first patient that we're going to be seeing today is Buster. Buster is a six-year-old neutered male poodle mix, pictured here. And his presenting complaint is that he seems painful and he's been walking strangely. So Buster's owner is going to tell us what he's been observing at home. So what are you seeing at home with Buster? So normally Buster is a really active dog, just zooms all over the place, jumps up and down off the furniture. He's just on the go. Um, but you know, for the past three, four days, he really has slowed down. He doesn't want to jump up on the bed anymore. I have to pick him up. Um, he's willing to jump down, but he just doesn't want to move as much. When I go to pick him up, um, he'll yelp. Um, and he doesn't seem to be as nimble as he usually is, especially in the back. Interesting. Well, that certainly sounds like it could be a neurological problem. So on physical exam, what we observed is that Buster was a little chubby. That's, that's okay. We, we see that a lot. Um, he's very well loved. He has a little bit of dental disease, also something we see commonly. On his neurological examination, he's ambulatory, meaning he can walk by himself, but he definitely is not normal in his back legs. And when we watch him walk around, what we observe is that he's crossing his legs over midline as he's walking, and he just looks really stiff. His reflexes are normal in all of his limbs, and he overall has good control over his tail as well. So based off of what we're seeing on his examination, we localize his problem to the T3 to L3 region of the spinal cord, meaning that we say that Buster has a T3 L3 myelopathy. When we go to palpate his back, meaning we're checking to see if something hurts, he screams when the middle of his back is palpated. Our top three differentials for Buster, after we've come up with our vitamin D scheme, are intervertebral disc extrusion, and much less likely something cancerous or something inflammatory. Meningomyelitis means inflammation of the spinal cord and the meninges. And this can be caused by both autoimmune conditions as well as infectious diseases. But in general, cancer and meningomyelitis are considered much less likely for Buster than intervertebral disc disease. Now, why would you, why would you oh, say, why would you say cancer is less likely for my dog? Well, that's an excellent question. I would say that cancer is less likely for your dog for a couple of reasons. The first is that your dog is only six. And so although we see cancer in dogs of all ages, six is a little young for us to be seeing cancer as a, as a likely differential for Buster. The other thing is that Buster's neurological signs came on relatively quickly. And although sometimes that can occur with cancer, usually cancer causes a slower progression of disease than something like intervertebral disc disease. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Excellent, great. So what I could offer for Buster at this point for you and Buster is that we could take some x-rays of his back. Now, those x-rays are not going to show us if Buster has slipped a disc, but it might show us if there's something else going on with Buster's back. And so if you're concerned about cancer, we could do some x-rays first. There's a chance that we don't find anything and he could still have a cancerous process, but in all likelihood, we're unlikely to see something cancerous in Buster. Now, the problem with the x-rays is that they're not going to tell us if he has an intervertebral disc that has slipped out of place. They might show us some signs consistent with it, but they're not going to diagnostically confirm that that's what's happening with Buster. So alternatively, the way that we could definitively diagnose Buster with a disc that slipped out of place is an MRI of his back. Now, this MRI is done under general anesthesia. I think he's an excellent candidate for it. He's an otherwise healthy dog. He's middle-aged. And so I think in all likelihood, he would do very well under anesthesia for us to investigate the cause of his issues. So from there, we could do a couple of things for Buster. 
we could just go straight into medical management. And what that means is that we say, you know, in all likelihood, Buster has an intervertebral disc that is extruded, meaning it has slipped out of place. And given that high likelihood, we could start with strict cage rest for him for four weeks. What that means is no running, no jumping, no playing, no down and off of furniture. He stays in the kennel, except when he goes outside to urinate and defecate and he comes back in. We'd also provide some pain medications for him as well. Alternatively, if you wanna figure out what's going on, we could do an MRI of his back. That will help us rule out cancer and rule out inflammation in his back. And we'll confirm that we have correctly found the problem, which is an intervertebral disc. It will tell us which disc is the problem. And it will also help us decide if we should be doing surgery or not for Buster. So what would it look like if we did an MRI of Buster's back? This is what it would look like. So what we have here for you are two MRI images. The top image is looking at Buster's back from the side and the bottom image is looking at Buster's back from front to back. And what we've done is we have taken a slice and we have put it flat up against the table. And that blue line that you're seeing there is showing you exactly where we have taken a slice from to look at Buster's spinal cord from front to back. What you see here is his spinal cord, that gray kind of snake going through there. All of these little kind of gray ovals, these are Buster's intervertebral discs. And for the most part, they look pretty good with the exception of this one right here. And what you can see is unlike the rest of them, this one is very dark and there's also material that is in the vertebral canal and it's causing compression of his spinal cord. If we look at this image down here, what you can see is that this is where the spinal cord should live and it's being really severely compressed. And so this is his spinal cord here, right? And then all of this dark material here is disc material that is extruded out of place and is causing compression. So Buster's prognosis overall is excellent if he has a disc extrusion. He is likely to get better with either treatment route that we pursue for him, either medical management or surgical management. Um, and if we medically manage him, he'll need to be strictly rested for four weeks. We'll give him an anti-inflammatory medication and we might give him a sedative just to make that process a little bit easier for him. If we take him to surgery, we'll do a surgery called a hemilaminectomy where we make a window into the bone to the back on the side and that allows us to scoop out the disc material. So I'm guessing that you have some questions in terms of what we do going forward for Buster. So what are some questions that you have about Buster's care? Yeah, so I have several questions actually uh, okay. that I'd like to know. So why do, why do dogs get disc disease like this and yeah. um, who's, who's affected? Excellent. So intervertebral disc disease occurs due to degeneration of the intervertebral disc. So what I have pictured here for you is an anatomical example of what an intervertebral disc looks like. We have a jelly center that's surrounded by a fibrous core. And this jelly center in dogs that have intervertebral disc disease degenerates and it calcifies. And so when that material calcifies, it eventually leads to disc rupture. And that ruptured disc material then has nowhere else to go but into the vertebral canal where it causes compression of the spinal cord. And that's where we see the signs that we see. We see spinal cord compression leading to a myelopathy and we see nerve root and meningeal compression which leads to back pain. In terms of who's affected by it, really any dog who's over two years old is at risk for developing intervertebral disc disease. We can see it in any dog breed but most commonly we see it in dog breeds that are called chondrodystrophic breeds. This means that we're thinking about dogs that have long backs and short legs. So dachshunds, corgis, and basset hounds. We also see intervertebral disc disease in poodles and other breeds like that, as well as in French bulldogs. But theoretically, any dog breed can develop an intervertebral disc extrusion. What are the questions? Yeah, so my buster doesn't seem so bad off. Um, how serious can this be? And what concerns should I have going for the future? So what kind of prognosis do we have? Yeah. Is he going to do this again? I mean, how many yeah. times am I going to have to get an MRI and surgery on my dog? Right. Excellent question. So the seriousness of intervertebral disc disease depends on how severely affected they are. And so the mildest cases only have back pain. Moderate cases have back pain and limb dysfunction, but they can still walk. Severe cases have back pain and cannot walk. And the worst cases are paralyzed and they lack pain sensation, meaning that when we pinch their toes, they can't tell us that they feel it. It also kind of depends on how quickly things progress. And so cases that progress slowly tend to have a better prognosis than cases that progress rapidly. So the overall prognosis for these patients depends on the severity, the rate of progression, and the treatment route that we pursue. Overall, I think that Buster has an excellent prognosis either way, given that right now he has limb dysfunction, but he can still walk. So in all likelihood, he's got a greater than 90% chance that he's going to get better with medical management, meaning cage rest and pain medications, 
and an excellent chance that he's going to get better with surgical management. Now let's say that Buster was less fortunate and instead he was paralyzed and he couldn't feel his toes. This is where it really matters. And so if we have a patient who is that severely affected, they've got about a 50% chance that they're gonna walk again if we take them to surgery immediately. They only have about a 5% chance of walking again if we don't take them to surgery. And so we really wanna avoid meeting patients for the first time when they're in this position. And ideally we wanna be able to intervene before they reach this stage. So it's definitely possible that Buster could have repeat episodes. The rate of repeat episodes at other disc spaces is about 10% in non dystrophic dogs. So I would say about a 10% chance this is gonna to happen to Buster again in the future. About 25% for dachshunds. Now this current disc is now a problem disc. And so there's a chance that within the next two years, about 50-50 chance that Buster is gonna redevelop clinical signs at this intervertebral disc space if we medically manage it really no chance that if we take him to surgery that he's going to redevelop problems at this same disc site. Okay. What other questions do you have? Yeah, so um, when's it an emergency? I mean, you, you sort of say you wanna see him, but if I can medically manage him, when do I really need to be worried about when I should see him? And, and yeah. if we go to surgery with Buster, what do I have to do afterwards? I know yeah, for excellent. medical management, I'm just resting them in time. Okay. Right, right. Yeah, excellent questions. So what I will say is that um, what's considered an emergency is that if, if Buster were suddenly not to be able to use his limbs, then we should evaluate him immediately. And we might be talking about doing surgery at that point for him if we've, if we've been doing medical management leading up to that. So if he suddenly can't use his legs or you feel like he's getting worse over time, then we should know about that because Buster at this point should look the same or better every day with treatment. The other thing is that if Buster were to come to us and he was paralyzed and couldn't feel his toes, then he's a candidate for emergency surgery. And so we would want him to be coming in as soon as possible. So if you were ever to run into this situation with Buster, either he can't use his limbs or he can't use his limbs and he can't feel his toes, we'd wanna to be intervening sooner rather than later for him. Okay. Now, what you should prepare for after surgery is that we need him to rest for another for four weeks after surgery. And that's because we need that intervertebral disc to heal. And if it doesn't heal properly, then he's at risk for more material squeezing out of place and causing compression of his spinal cord. And so he needs to be set up to be kenneled for four weeks following surgery. We want him to be improving every day they tend to plateau about six to 12 months after surgery. So ideally he should look the same or better each day, but if at any point he looks worse, we wanna know about it. And then usually in the six to 12 months after surgery, kind of what you see is what you're gonna get in terms of his neurological function. He may never be completely normal, but we do expect him to be able to be a functional pet and independent, meaning able to urinate and defecate on his own and able to have a comfortable, good quality of life. In patients who are really severely affected where they can't move their limbs, they also can't voluntarily void their bladders. And so those patients need bladder expression, meaning that we have to kind of squeeze on their bladders to help get the urine out. Now, Buster doesn't need that because he can move his legs. But if Buster couldn't move his legs, we will be talking about doing bladder expression for him. Now, this also probably doesn't apply to Buster because he's doing really well. But let's say that Buster was paralyzed. There's always a chance that he might not get better. And if that were the case, then we should have a serious discussion about what sort of lifestyle, lifestyle you want for Buster. And so he might be an excellent candidate for a cart like this dachshund here. A lot of dogs do very well in carts, um, but there are certainly situations where that's just not feasible. Maybe the dog is terrified of it. Maybe you live in a four or five story house and the dog likes to follow you all over the house and it would be very distressing for your dog to not be able to do that anymore. And so we would have to have a pretty significant conversation about what sort of lifestyle you want for Buster if he were paralyzed and never recovered. What other questions do you have? Yeah, um, can dogs develop disc issues in their neck? That's a great question. Yes, they absolutely can. So intervertebral disc disease is actually a very common cause of neck pain in dogs. Most dogs that have intervertebral disc disease in their neck don't actually develop neurological deficits. We can certainly see neurological deficits due to IVDD, but in general, most dogs with IVDD in their necks only have neck pain. And that neck pain can be really severe. Only about 50% of dogs with neck pain will respond to medical management and the rest of them should have surgery done to help them feel better. The most common surgery that we do is called a ventral slot and these patients have an excellent prognosis. And so all around, I would say that cervical intervertebral disc disease has an excellent prognosis for these patients. 
All right. Well, thank you very much for those questions. I hope that Buster does really well. We're going to go on to our next case now because patient number two okay. is here and ready to see us. All right. Okay. Just finishing up with discs. Um, we talked a ton about dogs. Cats can get disc issues. It typically are yes. wear and tear older patients, um, not young dog like young dogs. So it is something that we will see in cats. It's just not as common. Excellent point. I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Okay, Let's move on to our next patient. Patient two is here and ready. All right, right. Oli. Oli is a year and a half old male um, neutered Great Dane, um, presenting for being clumsy and unsteady on his feet. Um, and when did you start noticing this? So Oli has always been clumsy. Like I, so I got him when he was about eight weeks old and he would just like fall all over the place and it was the cutest little thing. And he just was all legs. He was just all legs. But, you know, I just thought that he would outgrow it. And he really hasn't seemed to outgrow his clumsiness. He's just like kind of all over the place, he's like a bull in a china shop. You know, he's just like stumbling, falling all over the place. He's kind of walking on the tops of his paws. And I just, I feel like at this point, he shouldn't be doing that anymore. Doesn't sound normal. So physical exam on Oli. Um, his general physical exam was fairly unremarkable. Some dirty ears. He had a cherry eye, so a prolapsed um, third eyelid. Um, otherwise, a very healthy, young Great Dane. A neurologic exam, he was ambulatory, um, but he did look clumsy in all four. He frequently crossed his legs, both front and back. Um, he doesn't want his neck moved side to side. Um, he kind of keeps it down sort of level with his spine um, quite a bit. Um, so with our exam, he's sure sounding like a cervical dog. Um, so a C1, C5 myelopathy with very mild neck pain. Oh, that was a bad one. Oh. Oli, where's your ball? Where's your ball? Where's your ball? Where's your ball? Where's your, your ball? Okay. For him, if we put together his type of dog he is, his history coming in and exam findings, our top differential is going to be wobblers or caudal cervical spondylomyelopathy. Um, other possibilities, he could have a malformed vertebrae, um, so a congenital um, that could cause similar type signs. Um, he could also have a, a meningomyelitis, so he could have an inflammation um, of the meninges and spinal cord causing this. Um, similar to um, our spine, um, our disc dogs, um, our diagnostics are going to be very similar. Um, we can do an x-ray um, of the cervical spine looking for obvious malformations. Um, it's not going to tell us what's happening with the spinal cord itself, um, but it can give us a hint. Maybe we see some degeneration that way. But again, minimal sensitivity with that. The MRI is going to be the diagnostic that we're going to want to, to proceed to. Um, with a wobbler type dog like this, um, you do have a couple of options on managing it. So you can do medical management for presumptive wobblers. So we think this is everything fits for this. It smells like a wobbler. It walks like a wobbler. Um, we could potentially medically manage it. Or we do the MRI and um, maybe we see if there's a surgical correction that can be performed. Excellent. So I, uh, yeah, just have a, a couple of thoughts on that. So what do you think about his prognosis? So prognosis wise um, is for me sort of on the fair to good prognosis. Um, and it really depends on how he progresses. So we can treat these um, and we can treat them fairly effectively. Um, it just long-term wise, um, if there's compression on the spinal cord, that compression is going to affect his ability um, down the road. He, if he was, should live to be say six to eight, he might not make it that long. Um, but his quality of life can be actually very good. Um, surgery is the same, is we can decompress, we can get these guys up and looking really good, 
um, but they can still degenerate down the road and have issues. Um, no. And again, MEC management is very similar, exercise restriction, anti-inflammatories. If I see a dog that we has sort of a, a more recent onset of signs, if I see them degenerate with medical management in the first couple of months, the expectation is, is that they're gonna to continue to get worse. So you might wanna think about doing something sooner than later. So that's where the dorsal or the surgical management comes in. There's a lot of different surgeries that can be done. Um, and it just lets you know that none of them are perfect for each kind of condition. Excellent. So I have a couple other questions. What exactly is wobbler syndrome? Um, it's essentially a narrowing of the, the canal. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that can happen. I think of it as um, if you watch the dog walk themselves, they kind of wobble. That's what their vertebrae are doing. They aren't formed perfectly to fit together as a nice piece. And so this wobble happens and the body doesn't like it. So it'll thicken the vertebrae or thicken the bones. It'll thicken the joint capsules and the ligaments. And that thickening compresses down on the cord. Um, and the, the sort of essentially two forms that come with that are the young form that you see in the Great Danes, the giant breed dogs, um, like we have on the top um, picture there, where it's compressing down on the cord. Um, the other are the disc associated ones. And these are mature dogs, so middle age and older, um, where their vertebrae aren't so bad, um, maybe a little bit of thickening, but in of itself, is not compressing and then they get a bulge disc um, and that pushes their spinal cord up because the canal is already narrowed, they're more sensitive to it. Um, so young Great Danes, young giant breed dogs, um, it's usually mature, older, um, Dobies are the poster child for that, but other large breed dogs can do it as well. Excellent, thank you. Well, it sounds like you took Ole to surgery and unfortunately our video is not playing, but do you wanna tell us how things went after surgery? So yeah. Oli. Uh, why are you? Come here. Um, Oli went from being this dog who had a difficult time even taking three or four steps, was always knuckling over, to where he returned to back to being normal. Um, the owners have a video of him running up steps all on his own, so he did great. That's excellent. Glad to hear that. Okay, patient number three is ready to see you. Oh, okay. uh-oh. But wait, we have an emergency. Oh my. Okay, so here is our emergency patient. So interrupting our normal appointment day, we have Penny who's come to us. And Penny is a two-year-old spade female husky who was hit by a car. And uh, it sounds like she just was found on the side of the highway. She didn't have a microchip or a collar. Immediately came into a clinic where they confirmed multiple back fractures on some x-rays and then a wonderful rescue organization took ownership and raised funds for her and brought her in and now they've brought her to us for further care. So on her exam she's really skinny and she's got multiple scrapes and bruises. Neurological exam, we're not going to do much here. We want to be really careful because we don't want to exacerbate any injuries that she may have. All we really need to know right now is can she feel her toes and the answer is yes she can and this is excellent news. This is excellent news for Penny. She can move her legs voluntarily, and this is even better news for her. So overall, we think that she's got a good prognosis. Even if she's not neurologically normal, her ability to move her limbs means that she has a good prognosis. So we're gonna take a look at her x-rays really quick because these are the x-rays that Penny came in with from the referring clinic. And what I will tell you is that I see a lot of different issues. We've got a fracture here. We've got a little hairline fracture here. We've got a fracture here. We've got another fracture here, right? It's kind of hard to, to look at this and not see a bunch of different issues. Got another little guy here, a little fragment here. So lots of different injuries in this dog who was found hit by a car. The important thing to, to caution you is that radiographs can underestimate the whole story. So x-rays don't always show us all of the issues and there might be more injuries. And we also really can't tell what's going on with the spinal cord. So we need to do some more imaging. So we took Penny to CT because CT is a really good way to look at bones. And what we see is a total of 11 fractures and or dislocations affecting her vertebral column. So we need to decide what to do for this dog. We can broadly do one of two things. 
and it depends on if her injuries are stable or unstable. Either way, her prognosis is excellent. If she couldn't have felt her toes, then her prognosis would have been very poor. But because she can feel her toes, Penny has an excellent prognosis. So the way that we're gonna decide how to manage Penny is that we need to determine if these injuries are stable or unstable. Stable injuries can be managed without surgery. Unstable injuries need to be managed with surgery. And the way that we determine if they're stable or unstable is a technique called the three compartment model, which is shown here. And basically that divides the vertebrae and the discs into three different compartments. And a, a lesion is considered unstable if two of the three compartments are compromised, all right? And she has several that are compromised, meaning that we should take her to surgery. So Penny goes off to surgery and we fix all of her dislocations. This took us about six hours to do this, right? And so we fix all of her dislocations. We put pins into the vertebrae to span the injuries. And then we anchor the pins into bone cement to make sure that everything is held in what we call rigid fixation. So we're gonna let Penny recover in ICU overnight and we'll check on her again in the morning. And fortunately, Dr. McVeigh has offered to see the rest of my appointments for me. So we're gonna go ahead and find out what happened with them. So the next one that Dr. McVeigh saw was Brutus. So who, who was Brutus? Brutus is a 10 month old boxer. He's presenting for pain, so he's yelping, and he's not eating or drinking normally for his owners. Hmm. Um, he has this history coming in um, of being a little lethargic for a week. Um, the primary vet found neck pain, and he also had a fever, so he was worried about infection. Um, we dove a little bit deeper into the medical records. They tried some antibiotics on him, and he just didn't seem to get better. They did some blood work initially to see why he had a fever. He, had, he did have an elevated white blood count. Otherwise, the rest of his blood work was normal. Okay. What'd you find? Um, he did have a fever in clinic. Um, he was drooling slightly, um, and he kept his head down low. Um, again, looking like maybe there's some neck pain. Um, mm. Neurologically, he didn't have any deficits. So if we could coax him up to walk, he could walk. He knew where his legs were, his reflexes were fine. But you try to move his neck, um, touch it, he would just scream. So we oh, localized wow. him to the cervical spine. Okay. What did you think was going on with him? Um, because of his young age um, and onset, um, our primary worry was meningitis. Um, and there's different forms, but the most common one we see are the steroid response of meningitis, arteritis. Um, the infection could still be there. Maybe it wasn't the right antibiotic. So could he have an infection in his neck, something called discal spondylitis? Um, or is it something non-neurologic? and he didn't have any deficits, could there be a foreign body? Did he get something stuck in the back of his throat that's causing an issue? Um, so with that, we would offer some further diagnostics. Um, again, um, x-rays could be done, fairly insensitive. Um, MRI, looking for something structural um, that we might not be able to pick up on um, radiographs. A top differential being meningitis, um, we would like to know, is there inflammation or infection going on? Um, so doing a spinal tap. Um, and then from there, doing additional testing, depending on what the initial analysis looked like to say, is this something infectious? Could it be Lyme disease like we discussed earlier um, mm -hmm. going on? Um, could it be some other infection? Um, if depending on how our diagnostics come out, um, then potentially treating with steroids. Okay. So what did you find? So in Brutus's case, um, his MRI was normal. We did a CSF tap that was not. Um, normal spinal fluid essentially looks like water. There's zero to five white blood cells. So there's very few white blood cells. Um, in Brutus's case, they counted over a thousand. Um, wow. The predominant white blood cells that were there were non-degenerative neutrophils, um, which is sort of a classic for the steroid response of meningitis. Um, those white blood cells are called in to fight an infection and they're not finding it. So they're just kind of hanging out and say, hey, what's going on? Um, so this confirmed our suspicion for a steroid responsive. Um, so we started them on a course of antibiotics. These dogs typically are better within 24 to maybe 48 hours. They're back to eating, their fever is broken, they're up and moving around. Um, and if treated appropriately, um, he went on to be very normal. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that he did well. Those are such rewarding cases because yeah. they've been so painful. And then 
you give them just a couple of doses of steroids and they're like, oh, I feel so much better. Thank you. I'm sure you feel the same way about them. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. So I just have a couple of questions for you um, sure. because, you know, I just want to make sure that I'm going to be taking good care of these cases going forward too. So what exactly causes SRMA? We really don't know the, what's initiates it, but it's an immune mediated disease. So the body's immune system is called in for some reason. We assume there's some other type of infection or something else that it doesn't have to be in the central nervous system, triggered the immune system to come in and attack itself. Um, and so the, the actual why, we don't know. We just, it's immune mediated because of how it responds to the steroids. Mm. Um, and yeah. I'll just leave it at that. And who, who exactly gets this? These typically are young dogs, less than two years old. Um, usually they're gonna be large breed dogs, um, but pretty much any dog can get it. Um, there are certain breeds we see it a little bit more often in, like listed here, boxers, um, the Bernese and the Beagles, um, but any dog can do it. Yeah. You know, my last SRMA case was a Cairn Terrier. No? Just a little tiny thing, yeah. Yeah, but I would say most of mine have been big dogs. Yep. Yeah, great, great. Okay. What's the prognosis? Again, it's excellent if treated appropriately. Um, so with these dogs, um, you start them on steroids, you have to keep them on steroids um, for, for me, a minimum of six months. Um, I'll do six months to a year with these. Um, and so depending on how that goes, as I taper down, if the signs come back as I'm tapering, um, I might go back up um, into a larger dose, or I might end up picking up or using a different immunosuppressive drug, especially if the patient doesn't tolerate steroids well, because um, yeah. there can be a lot of annoying um, side effects from that. The what other, go ahead. Steroids? What, what are those side effects? Um, so the, the annoying ones increase appetite. They want to eat everything. Um, the one that's probably a little bit more annoying than that potentially is they drink more and they pee more. Those are the, the ones that you see, they don't go away. Um, it can be hard on the liver, hard on the kidneys, um, can cause thin skin, poor hair coat, muscle wasting in of itself. So you have yeah. to look at um, those kind of side effects against what the disease has itself. Um, is we see their relapse chances. If you taper too soon, it's gonna come right back. Um, other potential triggers that can occur, um, things that overstimulate the, the immune system. So we try to avoid vaccination, um, especially during the treatment time, but even afterwards, um, we'll be judicious on what we do vaccinate against. We don't like to do the big multivalent ones um, constantly. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Well, I really do love these cases because they, they just, they feel so awful and then they, they Boom. Just do really well. So I'm glad you got to see one of those. They're great. So I don't have any more questions about, about his care. I feel pretty good about him. So, um, I was just wondering what about your last patient? Who else did you see? Yeah. So the last one of the day, um, kind of at the other end of the scale, this is Sydney. Um, and she's a nine-year-old female spade, golden, or golden shepherd, German shepherd. Um, and her presenting is loss of mobility. She's just having a hard time getting around. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it. Yeah. It sounds like she's been falling over when she's urinating and defecating and she's scuffing her toes. So yeah, and it's been going on. It's slowly progressive over the past okay. several months. Um, several months. Okay. Yep. So what did you find? So what you would expect in some older dogs, um, severe dental disease, because um, they're not brushing their teeth regularly, um, <laughs> and, and did have a heart murmur. Um, okay. it, it was a mild grade two, but it's something to consider, especially depending on how we go forward. Neurologically, she was an ambulatory paraparetic, fancy way of saying she could walk, but she had weakness in the back. So she was clumsy. Um, she had that sort of um, low dropping gait. Um, she crossed her legs over. Spinal reflexes were intact. Um, no pain on palpation. So she was comfortable quizzing the clients. They didn't think she was really um, painful either. Um, okay. So we localized her as a, a T3 L3. Yeah, yeah. Sounds, sounds reasonable.
What did you think was going on? So with a, a dog, this type of dog, this age, um, with these signs, um, my sort of top two concerns, one's degenerative myelopathy. Um, the other is a type two intervertebral disc bulge. So it's a slow bulge. Because it's slow, it doesn't elicit the pain that you see with uh, the acute disc ruptures um, mm -hmm. like we had on our first patient of the day. Um, and and it's, it's, it can be confusing. Is this a, a disc issue? Is this um, a, a degenerative myelopathy? Uh, I had tumor on the list because of the dog's age um, sure. and slow yeah. progression. Um, they don't have to be painful. A lot of tumors are, but, but they really don't need to be. Um, so when offering diagnostics um, to the client, um, the first was, you know, we can do a chest x-ray um, and look to see, is there any evidence for cancer um, in mm -hmm. the lungs? Um, from, from there, it's jumping up to an MRI, looking to see, is this um, a disc issue? So do we have a bulging disc? Is there a tumor in there? Um, potentially doing a spinal tap if indicated, um, and then um, genetic testing for degenerative myelopathy. Um, well, what do they end up depends doing? Depends on what they are. They, they, they really want to see what's wrong mm -hmm. with her, and they would consider doing surgery if it was a disc issue. Um, okay. So they elected to go forward with their diagnostics. Their x-ray was normal, um, which was good. Um, the MRI was normal as well, so there wasn't any significant compression. There were some degenerative discs, but they weren't doing anything to the spinal cord. Okay. Um, spinal tap for completeness was normal as well. Um, so we're backing into degenerative myelopathy, which is a diagnosis by exclusion. We've excluded yeah. everything else, and we're left with, this looks like degenerative myelopathy. The genetic test got sent off. It takes a couple of weeks to get those results back. Um, but it did indicate um, that she was affected or at risk. Um, and that at risk means that if she lives long enough, um, she would develop degenerative myelopathy, which is why yeah. we don't want to just jump right into doing the genetic test necessarily. And they, there couldn't be a disc that's causing the weakness right now. So that's why you did the MRI first? Correct. Gotcha. And we get those results right away. Yeah, right. Yes, instant gratification. Exactly. So what causes degenerative myelopathy? Um, oh boy, um, it's a genetic disease. Um, it's a slow degeneration. Um, it affects the whole nervous system, but predominantly the thoracic spine initially with de um, demyelination. Um, and it's what they found, it's, it's, it's a mutation of the SOD1 gene or the superoxide dismutase gene. Um, it's an over production of uh, that um, part of the cell, cell system. Um, because it's in the spinal cord, it's non-painful um, from that standpoint. So it's a variant off of ALS. So it's very similar to Lou Gehrig's disease in people. Oh yeah, that's a good point to bring up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who can get it? Um, pretty much any breed of dog can. There are some that are overrepresented. In our German Shepherd. Um, corgis are um, ones that we will see it in small breed dogs, um, are of the small breed dogs. Corgis are ones that get it. Um, predominantly large or giant breed dogs um, are the ones we think about. So boxers, again, Bernese are the overrepresented, but any dog okay. potentially can. Yeah. Well, what's the treatment? I, I'm sure that these people want to do everything they can for Sydney. They do. Unfortunately, there isn't any effective treatment out there for degenerative myelopathy. Um, it can be staved off a little bit by physical therapy. So you can get these guys into a regime to keep up their muscle mass, keep up their strength for as long as possible. Um, but there isn't any magic or therapy otherwise that, that's available. Hmm. What's the prognosis? Um, poor in the long run. Short term, they can do very well. Again, they're non-painful. Most dogs initially maintain their continence. But unfortunately, within six months to a year, these dogs will become non-functional pets, meaning that they aren't able to use their back end to walk. Um, you can cart them and they'll keep going for a little bit while, but it does affect the front legs as well. Is this something that affects cats? Good question. Um, I can't say that I've ever seen a cat or heard of one that would really get it, but it wouldn't surprise me um, if they potentially could. 
yeah, maybe eventually we'll find out that there's a mutation in cats. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you for seeing those patients for me. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Very busy day. Um, I'm going to go and check on Penny, my fracture dog, and see how she's doing. Looks like she's doing pretty well. So we'll come in and check on her again tomorrow morning. Wow. That's amazing. I know. Thank God. She is just like a trooper. Okay. That's great. Thank you so much. Okay. And um, I I'm so sad that I can't show you this video, but what I hope all you can imagine is that the day after surgery, Penny is up and walking just needs very minimal assistance. She's doing fabulously. She's not painful. She's eating and drinking. Dog is doing great. I couldn't be happier with the results. And I'm so happy to say that she got discharged from the hospital three days later. And after eight weeks of strict rest with a foster family, Penny was adopted and she is completely normal and pain-free. And here she is with a big fan group of hers here at the hospital on the day of her discharge. So overall, you know, just because she had a bunch of fractures and she was neurologically abnormal didn't mean that she couldn't get better and she has gone on to leave a, lead a very normal life. So I'm really happy with that. So thanks again for seeing those cases for me so that I could do penny surgery. You're welcome. And thank you all so much for your attention. We, um, we were really thrilled to give this presentation to you. Uh, we covered a lot of ground today. We covered some really important diseases. We covered intervertebral disc disease and wobblers, back fractures, steroid responsive meningitis, arthritis, and degenerative myelopathy. There are tons of other diseases that we could have talked about, but we chose to pick, we chose these because we thought they were important for you to know about. But we are happy to take any and all questions about these diseases, about other diseases. So I'm just going to, at this point, say that we're going to open up the floor to questions. Yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Drs. McVeigh and Arnold, for that great presentation. There's certainly a lot to learn through those cases. Um, and we'll work on adding the videos back in after the fact thank so you. that everyone can have the full experience. So we're a few minutes over, but we'll take a few questions for those who, who have a couple, couple minutes um, to spare. So I'll jump right in. Um, one question that we had from attendees is, can braces or other approaches akin to occupational therapy help with aging pets with joint degeneration? I'm happy to take that question. So question about braces. So it kind of depends on what part of the dog you're talking about. So for us as neurologists, I will say that back braces aren't really a thing that we see being all that helpful for our patients because um, our patients usually don't get arthritis in their backs. Um, and back braces are not all that helpful for dogs that have had IBDD either. Now on the orthopedic side of things, there are braces that are very helpful for dogs that have leg issues. Um, and so, you know, if they have trouble supporting themselves because they've got some tendon issues or joint issues, braces for, for that can be very helpful. Um, but in general for neurological conditions, in an older pet, their braces aren't all that helpful for kind of supporting them through it. We will put braces on patients that have had injuries. And so dogs that have had, let's say they were hit by a car and they have trauma to their neck, we might put a brace on that dog to, to keep them in a splint while they're recovering. But that's the main time when we would be applying a, a brace to a patient. Dr. Okay. McVeigh, you to add to that? For braces, I agree. Um, for some patients that have stable hind limb weakness, there are assist bands that can be used. So it's not really bracing, but it's sort of helping them to pick up their foot um, for them to place it so they don't knuckle over as, as much. Um, a yeah. lot of our patients will um, scrape their nails. Um, and so putting on um, some type of pad um, underneath so that they get traction or booties to protect their nails, that's about it. But um, actual bracing, no. There are also some, on that note, I was just thinking about that too. Um, another thing that we will frequently put on is a help em up harness, which is a harness that has two handles on it. And so it's got a front handle over the shoulder blades and a back handle over the hips. And for patients that just need help getting around, they're a godsend because they, they allow you to not be taking out your own back when you're lifting your, your pets up and down. So those are a really great resource for patients that are having mobility issues. That sounds really helpful. Um, so another question that we received is, are there things that owners can do to prevent neurological or spinal cord problems? Do you wanna take that one, Dr. McVeigh? Um, 
Yeah. So um, in some ways you could generically say, yeah, get a breed that doesn't get a back issue, but you could be that one dog that gets the back issue in that breed. Um, one thing is keeping them um, lean and mean. So if they're really fat and overweight, um, I think you're gonna increase your risk of issues. Those skinny dogs can get back problems um, as well. Um, try not to do a lot of the really big dynamic things that are fun to do with your dog, like play Frisbee, um, so that they're jumping and they're coming down on their spine like this. Um, so some of those kind of things, try not to encourage them to do, um, would probably help you out the best for your backs. I like to say that patients should, who have had disc issues, for example, should maintain a low altitude lifestyle. So avoid having them jump on and off of furniture because that puts excessive strain on them and um, essentially keep them you know, on the floor as much as possible, low altitude. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so one last question. Could you discuss some at-home PT exercises that could benefit small dogs with IBDD? Yeah, absolutely. So some really good things to do at home would be things called passive range of motion exercises. Now, what I think is important to emphasize first is that in patients who are acutely recovering from a disc issue, we don't want them doing a lot. We want them strictly rested. But in their recovery period in the months following, it's very appropriate to incorporate PT and at-home PT into your care for your pet. So the greatest things that you can do are passive range of motion exercises where you're kind of moving all of their limbs through their normal range of motion. That just keeps them from getting too stiff. That's a good thing to be doing. The other thing that you can do is you can fashion a, a kind of an at-home physical therapy course with something called Cavalettis, which is where you essentially could just put a, a ladder on the floor that has kind of narrow steps um, and put it on the floor and then walk your dog across the ladder because it'll kind of teach them how to pick up their feet a little bit more as they're recovering. You could do sits to stands potentially depending on how much function they have. So you put them into a sit position and then you have them go to a stand position. Initially, you might have to be assisting them as they gain strength and are able to do more. You can do less. The other thing you can do is not in the winter time and not in, with all dogs, but if you live by a body of water, you can bring them to that area and discourage them from drinking the water, but have them walk through it. Swimming doesn't necessarily help because when they doggy paddle, they don't use their back legs, which are usually the legs that need the most help with recovery. But if you have them walk in the shallow water, the kind of that's kind of like a makeshift underwater treadmill for them, and that can help increase their strength as well. Great. Well, um, thank you so much. I want to thank Dr. McVeigh and Dr. Arnold for your presentation and your insights um, and thank the many participants that shared such thoughtful questions during our presentation. Um, as always, the VMC is here for you 24-7 to help care for your pet. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And next month, we'll welcome Dr. Kumwa Choi, whose presentation, Acupuncture Beyond Your Imagination, will discuss acupuncture, how it works, and its application in the veterinary setting. So we hope that you enjoyed hearing uh, more about our team's work tonight. We encourage you to visit our website or reach out to us to learn more about our mission. We hope that you'll consider supporting our team in the work that we do to serve pets, both large and small. And thank you again for attending. We wish you and your families a safe and happy holiday season. And we look forward to seeing you in the new year. Well, bye everyone. It was, it was a real pleasure getting to give you this presentation today.